Around the World in 80 Days is a classic novel, everyone knows Jules Verne's story about Phileas Fogg and his challenge to traverse the globe in 80 days. Whether you read the book or watch the film with Steve Coogan the story is one that everyone should be familiar with. The BBC decided to kick off 2022 with a big-budget adaptation, fronted by David Tennant, boasting a series of globe-trotting locations and a score by Hans Zimmer, to put it mildly I was excited. I refamiliarized myself with the source material and sat down to watch. The series is almost nothing like the book. But that is a good thing. This series chooses to focus on creating believable characters who we as an audience want to spend time with. Fogg in the novel is an aloof, obsessive who can be very arrogant and hard to connect with. We don't ever really understand why he wants to go on this journey, he seems to be doing it purely for the money, and even then, he has no reason to as we know he's rich. This time he has received a mysterious letter from someone he clearly admires, calling him a coward and his friends don't seem to believe he can make it around the world. He goes on the trip for himself, to prove to himself and his friends that he is brave enough and clever enough to do it. He is joined by Passapartu, a character who served merely as someone for Fogg to speak to in the original novel. Here Passapartu has a family, and we see why he has joined Fogg. In the very first episode they visit France and Passapartu sees his estranged brother. Who is a freedom fighter in Paris? We learn about the relationship they had and that Passapartu left all that behind to explore the world. Passapartu has an aversion to violence and a hatred of killing people. He has morals and later on in the series we see how these impact him. The choice is made to make Passapartu a black man in 1872, not only does this counteract the primarily white cast it also allows for some important conversations. Passapartu's race isn't a gimmick or a box that has been ticked, it's an integral part of not only his character but the whole plot. And then we come to Abigail Fix, a character who was invented for this story. She is a character who seems at first to have one role, that of the strong female, something the novel was definitely lacking. But almost immediately she expands beyond that role, she is a journalist, she has her own motivations for going on the trip. It is her desire to get a story published under her own name in her father's newspaper. Her motivations are linked to Fogg's because if he makes it around the world then so does, she. Once again, the fact that she is a woman living in a society even more patriarchal than today is addressed suitably. Fogg and Passapartout feel they have a sense of responsibility to care for Fix and she feels that the only way to gain approval is to write an article and get it published under her own name. By creating a trio of characters, all of whom have defined goals and morals we as an audience care about them so much more and by no longer insisting these characters all be upper-class white men an audience can find infinitely more similarities with them. The show is written by Ashley Farrow, best known for Life on Mars. Because of the fact that this is a primetime eight-hour show, Farrow has chosen to drastically play around with the plot of the original novel. He's kept the characters mostly the same in the time period too, but the events of the story have been switched about. Whether due to COVID I don't know. The simple fact is that the original novel didn't involve much action, there was the encounter with the Indian tribe and their elephants, the danger with the train in America and... Oh that's about it. These events are simply not enough to sustain an audience's attention for 8 hours, and no one wants to watch 5 hours of fog throwing up over the side of a boat. Episode 1 sees the trio meeting one another. We see Fogg, a man who lives alone with his elderly manservant. In the book the first action Fogg takes is to fire his manservant. This tells us a lot about him, he is callous but also precise. The series takes a different approach to Fogg's character. He has an elderly manservant who is left behind because it would be impractical to bring him. Fogg receives a postcard with coward printed on it. This is one of a few clues as to his real motivations for embarking on his journey. Later, at his gentleman's club, after reading an article Fogg makes a wager of £20,000 that he can go around the world in 80 days. Passapartu, who has been working in the kitchens hears that Fogg requires a new manservant for a trip around the world, sensing an easy journey to somewhere new he tricks Fogg into taking him along. Fix hears about the wager from her father and feels it is to be her big break, so she tags along. The first stop on their journey is Paris, I was surprised at first, because Europe was a relatively simple part of the journey in the novel. Whilst there they meet Passapartout's brother, a freedom fighter, they seem very similar but have grown apart. As the group struggle through a Paris in turmoil, hoping to get to their next destination in time, they learn that Passapartout's brother wishes to kill the president of France. But when the shot is fired it is Fogg who is hit, luckily, he's saved in the typical cliché way. I mentioned earlier Passapartout's aversion to violence, it is this moment that it really begins, He's looked up to his brother, wanted to be like him and now he realizes that in actual fact his brother is dangerous and someone he doesn't want to be. 
but now the crew are suspected assassins and end up escaping France in a hot air balloon. The consequences of his brother's actions will continue to haunt Passepartout but not at this moment. Episode 2 takes place primarily on a train speeding through Italy. Pharaoh shifts the sequence which occurs in America in the book, to Italy in this case. You'll see why soon. This episode involves a lot of talking for large portions of it. We are able to slow down and explore the dynamics of the trio and how they interact. Fix starts to ask more questions of Fogg, attempting to tease out of him his true intentions for this journey. We learn about a woman who has clearly had a huge impact on Fogg. Meanwhile the fact that Passepartout is a servant is explored, he is unable to sit with Fogg and Fix in the first class carriages. Where the book would have just ignored this pharaoh utilizes it to show how alienated Passepartout is, and it makes his decision in episode 3 much more believable. Fogg's interactions with the young Italian boy show us that he can be compassionate and kind, the trip is not his only priority, and he is a much more interesting character. The acting from the Italian child is really stellar and cements my theory that native English speakers make very bad child actors. It is important that Fogg and the audience have an understanding of who this child because otherwise we wouldn't care what happened to him next. The train must perform an emergency stop, this is because the viaduct is broken. Fogg is annoyed because he might not make it to his next journey, but crucially he decides to continue not because of his wager, but because the young Italian boy has been injured. This shows how layered Fogg is and that he is more than just the wager. To save the boy's life Fogg directs the train crew to move the train slowly across the viaduct to safety. Both Fix and Passepartout also have a vital role. I think this is an excellent example of why this Fogg is much better than his novel counterpart. He exists beyond the confines of the plot and has character traits that don't simply serve to advance it. He is a likable protagonist, something which is quite useful when throughout the whole show we are asked to root for him. In the final sting, we learn that the member of the gentleman's club who bet against Fogg is in huge debt and needs the money to avoid bankruptcy, so he pays someone to slow him down. This man fills the role of the detective in the original novel. I always found that character to be a little superfluous, especially as we learn in the end that he was chasing Fogg for no reason. This time the antagonist has a real reason for being there and can still fulfill exactly the same role, I see no problem with him being changed slightly as it actually ties him more intrinsically to the characters instead of being an antagonist force for the sake of it. I'm writing this review one episode at a time, as they are shown and so far, episode 3 is my favorite. Everything comes together in this one, a great guest star, some superb visuals, excellent character development, and I get to gush about the score. So, let's start there shall we? Hans Zimmer provides a score which is at the heart of the whole show. The main theme is a ticking clock, it's constantly providing a sense of urgency which underscore every action, it interjects the show with a sense of Jane ne quoi. However, like Sherlock and Doctor Who it is often a little overused. The other pieces fit together really nicely, each location has a unique musical quality, but all are linked intrinsically by the constant ticking. In episode 3 the trio, I need a better adjective, finally leave Europe and arrive in Egypt. But they are running late and need to cross the desert to catch up. In an attempt to protect Fix from the dangers of the desert she is left behind. Fogg and Passepartout embark alone into the desert. Fix spots notorious an ex-noblewoman played by Lindsay Duncan. Apparently she is well known as a, for want of a better word, philanderer. She is reluctant to ask for her help but being alone in a foreign country she doesn't have much choice. Meanwhile Fogg and Passepartout have been conned by their guide and left to die in the desert. The show really takes advantage of on-location filming in South Africa. Director Steve Barron, whose previous credits include several influential music videos and 1990s Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, clearly understands how to create a sense of scale and makes the landscape legitimately scary. Fix and Lindsay Duncan catch up with Fogg and Passepartout quite easily, and while they are recovering from water deprivation Duncan and Fix have a conversation which has huge ramifications for Abigail going forward. She learns that Duncan and her father once knew each other, and when Duncan refused to go out with him, he began a campaign to falsely sully her reputation. He printed lies in an attempt to discredit her, and because he was the powerful editor of a respected newspaper everyone believed him. This is extremely important for Fix, like Passepartout she had someone in her life who she looked up to, someone who she modeled herself on and who turned out to be a lie. It changes everything, she no longer wants to be anything like her father and now wishes to be her own person, she chooses to go on the journey purely for herself and not for the admiration of her father. Pharaoh has made this a theme throughout the show, and it's a good message, be yourself, don't try to imitate others and do the things you're doing not for the betterment of others but for yourself. Fog. Fix and Passepartout choose to push on through the desert to get to their destination, 
This involves passing through a very dangerous territory controlled by a vicious tribe. The group make it through the desert physically unharmed, but Pasapartu is forced to do something unforgivable, he kills someone. Not, like his brother, from some warped moral high road, but purely because Fogg told him to. Pasapartu is disgusted not only by the fact that he is killed but by the fact that he is now no better than his brother. He blames Fogg, who is completely oblivious to the effect of his actions, he's become consumed by his 80-day journey and lost any compassion he had in the previous episode. When they reach the next town, the trio are able to relax and Pasapartu is cornered by the man paid to stop Fogg. His name is Needling and just as he did in the book, he gives Pasapartu a concoction with which to slow Fogg down. In the novel it is Pasapartu, who is the cause of Fogg's lateness, but it didn't feel justified, Pasapartu had no reason to willingly to sabotage his employer other than plot convenience. The show establishes a clear motive for his actions, and they have character relevance. I think that, that this is an infinitely more satisfying way to delay Fogg. In part 4 they have made it India, and in a small village they beg for a guide once more, but a wedding is taking place. Fogg, Fix and Pasapartu become entangled in the preparations. After a night of partying Fogg does not sober up. This is because Pasapartu has drugged him, at the request of needling. Fix, worried for the continuation of their journey, brings him to the town leader, who explains that if he isn't cured soon, he will die. This show's position as a universal family program is to its detriment here. Pharaoh chooses to use Fogg's impending doom as a source of comedy, he races around the town acting like a madman, I see why this has been done. The show has a target audience of nine-year-olds it's shown at six o'clock on a Sunday night. However, the comedic moments significantly reduce tension. Whilst he is stumbling around the town he begins to hallucinate, he thinks Fix is Estella, so he apologizes for being so cowardly, then promptly passes out. Pasapartu, being a person who is really and truly good at heart immediately apologizes for his actions and rushes to help Fogg. This is a decision which is accurate to his character above all else, it feels exactly like an action he would take. He was angry with Fogg after what he was forced to do in the last episode but never wanted to hurt anyone. While all this has been going on the British have arrived, Verne's novel ignored the fact that Britain controlled most of the territories Fogg passed through. Pharaoh handles the colonists expertly, he doesn't condone their actions, nor does he demonize them. The groom ran away from the army so he could be married, and his commander is extremely angry, he recalls him and threatens to execute him. This section is clearly meant to replace Fogg's unfortunate encounter with the thuggies, based on what little knowledge I have been afforded by Temple of Doom they're not exactly cozy Sunday night viewing so replacing them with the British army is good swap. It affords a cultural relevance to the show and provokes discussion among families about the actions of their country, something Doctor Who could learn from. The bride begs Fogg, as a prominent English gentleman to speak on the groom's behalf. He agrees somewhat reluctantly, as he is not a confident man. But he speaks from the heart and gives the best Doctor Who performance I've seen on a Sunday night in. Well ever. His impassioned words speak directly to the general. He's a three-dimensional character, a young man thrown into a world where he is seriously out of his depth. By appealing to his nature Fogg convinces him of the power of love. Adjacent to Fogg and Passapartout's misadventures, Fix has been having some of her own. She has an important conversation about where she goes after the revelations about her father, how should she continue with her life now that it's falling apart. She decides that the best way to continue is by writing the truth, so she takes all the information she's learned about Estella, Fogg's real reason for going on the trip, and adds it to her article. She puts together the clues that we have found out about her and realizes that Estella and Fogg were once romantically entangled, but it all fell apart when she left to travel the world and he didn't follow her. Fix believes that Fogg is taking this trip to prove to Estella and himself that he isn't a coward. I like this, it adds depth to the character, it also adds mystery as the show allows us to put the pieces together before revealing the solution, therefore, including audiences of all ages in the puzzle. Fix feels that if she tells Fogg's story as it really is then she will be doing the right thing, she decides not to be a liar like her father. In the end, the bride and groom are happily married and Fogg, Passapartout and Fix leave for Hong Kong. Needling vows that Fogg won't escape again. I have been overwhelmingly positive about the show so far because I think it's really good, episode 5 is still great but the magic is starting to run out. The sets so far have been vast in scope and stunning. They've really made you feel as though you're traveling the world, in contrast Hong Kong looks like a national trust house. So little time is spent in the actual city and so few or the characters are of Asian descent, I guess this could once again be a comment on colonialism, but the other episodes did it so much better, they included not just the colonialists but the natives too. The story of this episode focuses on needling trying to stop fog leaving, 
In an homage to the original novel, he poses as a detective to stop Fogg taking out any money, this means Passepartout has to contact an old acquaintance. Passepartout's friend asks him to steal an artifact stolen by the governor for his wife. Meanwhile the whole world has read Fix's article. This is a problem as Passepartout points out that Fix has done Fogg a huge disservice by printing the truth. She's exposed Fogg's deepest secret to the world without asking him first. This could turn Fix into a dislikable villainous character, but Pharaoh has set up her motivations so expertly in the previous episodes, it fits perfectly with her arc, she will learn that printing the truth, while preferable to lies, can often hurt people just as much as a lie could. Fogg is angry with this invasion of his privacy, he storms off. Not only has he been betrayed by Fix, but he learns that Passepartout has also been lying to him, he realizes that he was a waiter at the gentleman's club. Then Fogg is arrested. It appears that Passepartout has stolen the artifact and the governor believes it was the cash-strapped Fogg. Fix and Passepartout rush to save Fogg from a flogging. Once more the power of love prevails and the governor forgives Passepartout, allowing Fogg to go free. Fogg is still angry with Passepartout and Fix, but he softens slightly because they did save his life. I like the continuation of Fix's plotline, even if the message seems a little off. But the repetition of last episode's plot is annoying, the show appears to be running out of events that can happen in the places they stop, I don't want this to devolve into a dastardly and muttly level story in which every week needling tries to stop Fogg and they escape. This can happen once or twice but never one after the other. Okay, it's fair to say that I wasn't a huge fan of episode 5. Episode 6 however solidly cemented itself as one of my favorites. This time the trio, I really must find a better name for them, have been thrown off their steamer by needling and washed up on a remote island with no inhabitants. This episode feels totally separate from the rest of the story and also like an integral chapter. Primarily the only characters we see are Fogg, Fix, and Passepartout. They are trying to survive on this remote island, but they also need to hash out the problems that have arisen in the previous story. Fogg is still very angry with Fix for exposing his secrets and is reluctant to speak with her. Whilst she understands his anger, she is reluctant to leave him alone. She apologizes vehemently and they return to, if not normality, a position of trust. I'm glad to be honest that this plotline wasn't dragged out for too long, conflict for conflict's sake is pointless and there are so many other problems now that needling has come along that it isn't necessary. Fogg also takes the opportunity to confront Passepartout about the fact that he lied about being a professional manservant. But Fix, misunderstanding, accidentally reveals that it was Passepartout who poisoned Fogg back in India. When Passepartout explains that he had been played by needling to slow him down but that he is really, really sorry Fogg goes ballistic. Understandably so as the man he's paid to support him on his journey, his friend, has just admitted to betraying him. Fogg storms off to the other side of the island with Fix and begins to build a raft, he is clearly in pain and focuses his energy on getting off the island. There is very little mention of the actual journey because the trio are much more focused on staying alive. In the morning, while gathering water Fix comes across Passepartout, who has clearly eaten some very bad lobster, he's close to death, so she brings him back to camp. F and F immediately abandon everything and rush to help Passepartout. I think that this moment epitomizes Fogg's character, at times he can be an arrogant self-centered arse but when it comes down to it, he is kind-hearted and a truly decent human being. All of his anger at Passepartout is gone and he even burns their raft to keep him warm. It doesn't matter that Passepartout is the servant and Fogg the master at this moment they are just two human beings one of whom needs the help of the other. By burning the raft Fogg shows that he has changed, his goals and motivations have adapted. He still wants to make the trip but not at the expense of the lives and happiness of his friends. Whilst caring for Passepartout, Fogg is able to forgive his friend and their interpersonal conflict is finished. But Fix is not forgotten, it's clear from her actions, and some flashbacks to previous episodes, that she is steadily falling in love with Passepartout. On reflection it's a little forced but certainly better developed than Fogg's whirlwind romance in the novel. There is clearly chemistry between the pair, and it is set up nicely. Passepartout clearly had feelings for her, but she was too busy until now to notice. And as F and F watch over Passepartout as he recovers from his fever fog finally opens up about Estella. The pair were engaged to be married, they were going to travel the world together and be married in Paris. But Fogg was too scared to go with her and so he abandoned her at Dover. She went on without him. This gives new context as to why Fogg rushed through Paris in episode 1, he couldn't bear to be there for a minute longer than he had to. He is going on this trip to prove to himself that he isn't the coward Estella has branded him as. The grounded, smaller story and on location allows for a check-in on the characters without having to worry about external forces that want to stop them. 
it proves that this is a program which is just as much about characters as it is plot. We also return to the gentlemen's club occasionally in this episode. This is to show the reaction these gentlemen have to the news that Fogg and his friends are missing presumed dead. Understandably Fix's father is distraught at the thought of losing his daughter, but he is less of a focus, odd but we can look past it as there's a lot going on. The real focus is Bellamy who had previously contracted needling to stop Fogg. Bellamy is really interesting, it's clear that he is very upset at the loss of a great friend, and he also feels responsible for killing him, obviously. But the performance is nuanced because beneath all that we see that deep down really, he's pleased because he has won his wager. We've seen previously how horrible he was to Fogg, and I think it's for this reason he never made it on his round-the-world trip with Estella. Bellamy is the real coward, he's a bully and a terrifyingly real antagonist who encapsulates the British upper class perfectly. The trio depart the island closer than they ever were before, Fogg tells them that he's never felt happier than when he's around them, they feel like equals finally and the best news of all is that they are only one day behind schedule. Roll on Episode 7. As expected, the theme of racism is addressed in this episode as the trio cross in America which is still readjusting after the Civil War seven years before. But no one could have predicted the frank and realistic portrayal of a such a subject at 6.20 on a Sunday. This is an episode with a real conversation about the KKK, the way it handles the subject is poignant and educational. It's something Doctor Who Series 11 episode Rosa wishes it could have been. The episode begins, as all of them have, in media res. The trio are crossing America in a carriage, there is a discussion about the journey so far and what is to come, I'll admit that the direction here is a little flat but unless you're Loki director Kate Heron it's hard to make a seated conversation interesting. Their journey is interrupted by the entrance of a black sheriff and his white prisoner. From the outset the sheriff is portrayed as the one in the wrong, he fires a gun for no reason and seems grumpy and violent, his clothes are dirty, and his sheriff's badge is deliberately obscured. His prisoner on the other hand looks immaculate, he seems the complete antithesis and seems immediately likable. These characters play on the stereotypes inherent in society. Fogg and the audience are misled into believing that this prisoner must have been wrongly imprisoned, and his captor could be pretending. Before the sheriff has said a word you conclude about him. The prisoner, Abernathy, works hard to wheedle his way into the affections of Fogg, he is a fan of him after reading about him in the paper but then begins to say some rather suspicious things about a place for everyone. The sheriff, Reeves, explains soon after that the prisoner is in fact a prominent member of the KKK. Immediately, Fogg and the audience feel unclean, within just a few moments this man has gone from falsely accused white man attacked by a dangerous black masquerading as a sheriff to irredeemable enemy captured by a sheriff doing his duty. It causes the audience, Fogg and Fix to consider their own unconscious racial bias and yet never ever demonizes them, the show isn't interested in condemning the unconscious opinions of its viewers, instead it wants to teach the young people, and their parents, who are watching at home to think about their own prejudices. It knows that people will have formed an opinion and wants to show them that they are wrong. Reeves then explains his own background as a liberated slave who became the first back sheriff in Oklahoma. Then the episode continues, Reeves is just a sheriff, nothing more needs to be said, his race is addressed and promptly moved on from as it would be unnecessary to focus on it. The coach stops at a water source, and everyone gets out. Passapartout has a conversation with Reeves about Abernathy. It's a bold move to talk about such a dark topic as the KKK in a television show meant for 10-year-olds but it's also important, they are never explicit we don't see the men in masks, instead we see the people underneath them and they don't look scary, they look normal which is all the more powerful it's not just about the racism inherent in America in 1872 but the racism across the world today. Meanwhile Abernathy is discussing, with Fogg, the burgeoning relationship between Fix and Passapartout. He suggests that it is improper, Fogg takes this to be because Fix is of a different social class to Passapartout until he realizes that Abernathy believes their race is the problem. Fogg expresses his indignation at this suggestion because it is clearly ludicrous. It serves to redeem Fogg somewhat after his previous prejudices and also cements Abernathy as a terrible person. The coach travels on and in the most haunting visual in the show we see a cross atop a pile of stones and beneath a tree, the camera focuses on it as the carriage passes through. It's clearly to commemorate the death of a victim of a lynching and has significance to those with a better understanding of the context surrounding this episode. Later on, some of Abernathy's fellow clan members ride past and the camera focuses on them instead of the cross. This piece of visual storytelling shows us what these people are long before it is confirmed verbally. They arrive in town ready to catch the train that will take them to England but find that Abernathy's cronies have caught up to them. They attack Passapartout, Fogg and Reeves in the saloon. 
Fix remains free as she was sending a telegram to her father letting him know she was alive. Abernathy and his crew proceed to deliver an ultimatum to Fogg, he must remove one of Passapartout's fingers in order to escape alive. It's at this point that Fix rides in on a horse and shoots Abernathy. Then a full-on shootout occurs Passapartout, Reeves and Fix attack the men mercilessly. It is presented as perfectly acceptable to kill these men as they pose a tangible threat to the trio, and it feels morally justified to murder them as they are white supremacists. This is in contrast to the tribe's folk that Passapartout shot in the desert, there he had no reason to kill they hadn't done anything wrong. Admittedly we don't see much of the actions of these men, but it is enough to know they are members of the clan. With Abernathy's friends dead and minutes to go before their train arrives Fogg and Reeves chase after Abernathy, Fogg corners him in a barn and holds him at gunpoint, as Abernathy speaks to him, he starts to lower the weapon, Fogg won't kill a man under any circumstances. We start to fear that Fogg may not even have what it takes to keep Abernathy contained until Reeves arrives but then Abernathy starts once again on the topic of Fix and Passapartout, Immediately his love for his friends overcomes all and his steel returns he walks towards Abernathy gun raised and, in that moment, it seems plausible that Fogg might actually kill him. Fogg has become a character almost unrecognizable from the quiet, reserved and obsessive man who set out from the reform club. With Abernathy in chains once more, order is restored, and the trio race off to catch the train. But not before a conversation about the burgeoning relationship between Passapartout and Fix is had, all is denied, and typical awkward romance lines are uttered although I'm sure all will be resolved next week. What I didn't mention earlier was the dynamic between Passapartout and Reeves, Passapartout latches onto Reeves as a clear role model. Like his brother Reeves fights for what he believes in, but he is a much worthier role model as his morals don't allow for the death of innocent people. Back in London the Reform Club is still reeling from the news of Fogg's death last episode, but when Fix's telegram arrives her father is overjoyed. Jason Watkins' performance in this moment reminds us why he is one of Britain's greatest unsung acting icons. The raw emotion at the is simply perfect, and the look on Bellamy's face was hilarious. He is barely able to hide his disappointment, but he hasn't yet resigned himself to the fact that Fogg has won, in fact he's still hopeful. The episode ends with Fogg stood in New York's train station looking up at the clock which is the same one which appears on the postcard he received from Estella, the one with coward printed on it. Episode 8 effectively concludes all the plot threads in an engaging and believable way. Plus, it sets up the Jules Verne cinematic universe. We begin the episode exactly where we left off, Fogg is stood in the train station looking up at the clock. He expects Estella to be there to greet him, but when she is not, he takes his seat on the ship bound for England. Fix and Passapartout look out over the water and hold hands. It's their joy that encourages Fogg to continue to pursue Estella. He returns to the station and waits, it gets closer and closer to the boat's departure, but Fogg won't leave. It's clear that for him this journey was never about getting back to England, but instead his goal was to be here and for Estella to know he is there, everything is shown in a new light we see Fogg's journey as only he has seen it. He is, in this moment, much closer to his novel counterpart as we see that his calculating brain has been ticking away since the start. Fix was only allowed to join the crew because she was a journalist who could help Fogg get his journey the publicity it needed for Estella to find him. Estella arrives and she is everything we had expected her to be, feisty and adventurous and completely at odds with Fogg. She berates Fogg, partly for leaving her at the station 20 years ago, but mostly for wasting his life. Any other program would end with Fogg getting the girl and settling down, in fact this is exactly how the novel ends. Pharaoh decides to completely subvert the norm by refusing Fogg the fairy tale ending because he knows it would be unrealistic and unearned. Estella, played by Dolly Wells who is always excellent, has moved on with her life, she's got children, she had a marriage and is happy. She tells Fogg as much, whilst she still cares for him her affection is much more platonic than romantic. She asks Fogg as he has the time to spare telling her about his journey, he responds that he is all the time in the world Estella and the audience know this is a lie but she indulges him, even as the score ticks louder she berates Fogg for wasting time with her, he tells her that if might be too late for them but he can still win the wager, and most importantly beat Bellamy. Fogg runs from the station, towards the port and we return to the reform club. Bellamy is sh ting himself because Fogg is nearly home so he contracts needling to stop him by any means necessary. To needling this means killing Fogg, he has him cornered in a warehouse, the ship is about to sail, Fix and Passapartout are nowhere to be seen when suddenly a gang of street thugs rock up. They attack needling and Fogg in an attempted mugging. Fogg uses his hitherto untapped public school fighting skills to beat the thugs but needling is impaled on his own knife. His final act is to give Fogg conclusive proof that Bellamy is evil. 
Fogg's behavior in this sequence should be a continuation of his character but the fact is the only reason he's fighting them is because they are in between him and the boat. I don't like this, it's been shown time and time again that Fogg is a man of morals, someone who abides by his principles at all times, this attack is unmotivated and uncharacteristic. It's also plainly just blatant padding. Fix and Passepartout are settling in on the ship, their tickets are first class and they intend to enjoy it. That is until a character credited as ignorant man presumes Passepartout is a waiter, he then makes some truly abhorrent comments about the color of Passepartout's skin. Fix attempts to support Passepartout who responds with I've been dealing with it all my life and sirs down. With this scene we see the inescapable nature of racism, wherever Passepartout goes it follows him. The film then delivers a beautiful and poignant message about ignoring the opinions of others. Passepartout and Fix begin to dance passionately, this angers the ignorant man and his friends who proceed to walk out of the room. They dance to a version of the show's theme tune which cements the fact that the constant ticking clocks have been a part of all of the trio's lives, not just Fogg. We slowly pan upwards to see Fogg, admiring their dance from afar, he seems happy to allow the pair to live in the moment, accepting that while he may not have found love on the trip he's made friends he can be proud of and help their romance to blossom. The scene delivers a message which is an antidote to hated show's acceptance and tells the audience to do that too. They arrive in England with hours to spare and Fogg is thrown in jail, it seems that the warrant for his arrest in Hong Kong was never formally retracted. He's thrown in jail, he's fallen at the very last hurdle, so close to home. This is how the book ends as well, but it feels so much more cohesive the warrant was a plot thread set up earlier, and while I still don't like episode 5 it does give it slightly more narrative relevance. While they wait for Fogg to be released Fix and Passepartout chat about the future, the deeply upsetting truth is that their relationship won't be able to continue once all this is over and while Passepartout won't admit it, this saddens him. I'm going to take this opportunity to praise Leone Benish and Ibrahim Koma who play Fix and Passepartout respectively. Both are relatively unknown actors who show a huge amount of range in their performances. Benish injects Fix with a hugely likable energy and her chemistry with Koma makes them inherently watchable. This is a character-driven story and their performances reflect that. Without them the show wouldn't be half as good. Benish in particular was a standout, not least because she made Fix one of the strongest ginger role models in a long time. The crushing blow really comes when Fogg is released from custody knowing he's failed but still having to travel home, the dejected unenthusiasm they exhibit walking back towards the train is brutal. They arrive on the doorstep of Fogg's house and everything is slow, the fast cutting and is replaced with long sweeping shots, even the ticking has faded to an almost imperceptible level in the score. Grayson, Fogg's elderly manservant shuffles agonizingly slowly to the door, but life has gone from everything. Even the color palette has become more drab. And then Grayson drops the bombshell, the one foreshadowed in episode 1, though I didn't mention it, as Fogg travels round the world he has managed to gain an extra day because of complicated time zone maths. Momentarily there is silence, even the score is trying to work out what's going on and then it kicks into gear once again. Fogg races to the reform club, arriving to see a sea of reporters gathered outside, but he stops. The weight of what he has achieved is overwhelming, he never did it for the glory and now he doesn't know if he even really wants it. But Fix and Passepartout urge him on. The next 10 seconds are agonizingly tense, especially as a liberal amount of slow motion is used. But Fogg makes it into the room just as the clock strikes one. The release was such that I cheered aloud, the show did such a great job of making sure the stakes were sufficiently explained and the characters likable enough that we cared. Bellamy attempts to smarm his way out of paying the wager to Fogg, but it appears that Fogg had been sufficiently organized to nip this attempt in the bud quickly. But instead of taking Bellamy's money he offers him the £20,000 instead. This is such a perfect ending, Fogg was never in it for the money, the experience was enough of a reward, and by forcing to Bellamy to accept the money to avoid bankruptcy it completely ruins his social standing. His exit from the club is almost the complete reverse of Fogg's entrance. He walks out at a leisurely pace, and whilst Fogg greeted by cheers Bellamy is inundated with booze. I feel sure he will return soon as he definitely has a score to settle. The trio and the story where Fogg began it, he is seated in his usual chair surrounded by his new friends reading the newspaper. They peruse an article about a creature terrifying boats at sea, clearly a 20,000 leagues reference, and before the Reform Club members can return they have left to pursue their next adventure. I think that it's an excellent idea to expand the plot to encompass all of Jules Verne's back catalog. There's so much still to draw on and the trio are inherently watchable. I simply can't wait for series 2. It's very early in the year to start picking favorites and calling things a masterpiece, but by the mere fact that I've written over 7000 words on 8 episodes of TV, of which at least 6000 are positive, it's fair to say that this show is great. 
It's visually stunning, the score is one of my favorite Zimmer compositions and it has a lot of competition. The actors are born for their roles and the characters go on personal journeys which are some of the best I've seen on screen, they feel justified. Fog, Fix and Passepartout feel like real people and not cardboard cutouts. And most incredibly of all this is the closest to Doctor Who we've come since 2017. It's a show that appeals to all ages and is educational, we should really be considering David Tennant for the 14th Doctor it's amazing no one's mentioned him yet. It's a perfect update to an outdated source material and thankfully Pharaoh doesn't drop the ball at the last minute, I'm looking at you life on Mars. Go and watch this now. This is why we need the BBC.